Um, late as always, but part of the reason I was late is you bugging me. I don't know how these, see how this thing tastes. When I was sick with the COVIDs, my friends bought me a care package of medication, a sympathy for the loss of my mother card, which was hilarious. Um, my mother is still very well alive. We just don't get along. So it was a joke uh, before people think that something actually happened and I'm laughing at it. Um, and then they also brought me alcohol, which at that time I could not even fathom. But it's still been outside and the box is frozen to my deck. Um, and these were all frozen inside, so I got one out and let it thaw. So who knows how they're going to taste, but we'll find out. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're going to pair some snakes up. Evening, Mike. Let's see. Oh, these are so blurry. Hey, how are we doing? I got to clean those. I can't see out of them. It's not any better. I'm finally starting to wear my cheaters because I can't see shit and um, I can't read. Um, well, I, I, I can read, but it's, it's hard for me to read stuff. What's up, man? Welcome. Um, so we're going to pair a few things today. Um, I fed several days ago. I'm right on the cusp of where I would probably normally have paired tomorrow, ideally. But there's a weather front moving in at about 3 o'clock this morning, so I want to get them together now. Um, yeah, we're going to pair some bloods. Uh, we're going to pair some short tails. Um, the way that I'm set up, it does mean during this live stream, I'm going to have to move you around a little bit as I pull bins out and things like that. I might have to clean a tub or two um, if they've gone to the bathroom or done anything since yesterday. Um, you know, I obviously don't want to pair them up if it's filthy, if it's you know, tossed a little or something like that. I don't care because they're going to do that anyway. But if they've gone to the bathroom, I'll clean them. Um, I know Lilith is good. I know the Big T Positive is good. I'm not sure on Electra. I haven't checked her yet today. I know the Skunk Line Girl is good. I believe my Matrix Head is good. And I'm not sure on Morticia. Um, I haven't checked her since since yesterday. Uh, so we'll see when we pull those things down. What's up? Perfect weather. Yes, exactly. It's going to be perfect weather tonight for uh, pairing these snakes now. Uh, don't forget, you guys, we're going to have to remind you throughout this, but make sure if you're in here, you're watching, you're enjoying it, hit the like button. Um, it, it just makes such a difference in driving this stuff out there. Uh, now, those of you that follow along on the community page, I'm trying to get more people to do that because I do post stuff on there. I let you know ahead of time things that may be going on. Uh, so thank you whoever just hit like there. Uh, how's your T-Positive Ivories doing? Uh, they're doing fine. Uh, anyways, community page, I post pertinent things on there. So today I said we were going to go live tonight and uh, that people had an opportunity to enter um, to win some stuff. And depending on how many people entered and all that, we would d dictate what we're going to give away. Um, I think four or five of you, I believe five of you, did that, message me uh, everything. If anybody's done it within the last like 10 minutes, I didn't catch it with the exception of Angel and Dina who just, I, I did catch it because that came up. Email I haven't checked in about 15 minutes. Um, is there notifications? I don't think the community page sends notifications. I think it's one of those things where you kind of have to be abreast and go and check it out. I don't, I don't think it does that. It just comes up in your feed, especially if you're subscribed uh, with the bell on and all that. It should appear in your feed. Um, as you scroll through your subscription feed um, and that stuff. Um, but otherwise, you know, just check it every couple of days if you think of it. Um, just gives you a chance to uh, know what's going on a little bit better and uh, have a chance at, at getting some free stuff once in a while, you know, and that's not so bad. Uh, thank you to the two others that hit the like button. Three now, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so uh, T-Positive Ivory, let me see. Over here. Come on. The female is still extremely hateful, um, and that's the male there. And we're uh, we're trying to put a little bit of size on him, so maybe he'll be ready for next year. Um, he's a little on the small side. His sister's a little bit bigger than him, but not much. Um, he's still weary too, uh, but he's not as bad as she is. I mean, she would have bitten me 17 times by now. Uh, she just doesn't doesn't get down with the handling at all. Uh, so we just we just leave her be and let her do her thing. But he's he's a little bit better about it. 
Um, he'll just get nervous, eventually track my face. And if I put him close enough, sometimes he'll take a shot at my face, which those of you in members only probably remember from a while back. Um, he's a good eater. He just doesn't really like to take food off tongs. You've got to leave it for him. Um, he will take birds off tongs, just not rodents, uh, but he will eat anything. So it's just a matter of, um, you know, um, putting it down in there for him, shutting the lights off, and he usually eats it right away. So I'm going to throw him back in here for right now. Since he's nervous, I try to limit the amount of time he's out. Short positive experiences. Uh, the, the better we, we do every time. Um, i got a cut on my hand, man. That sanitizers things every time. And it's cut like right on like, uh, I don't even know what you call this part of your hand right here. It's not a major cut, but it just won't heal because it's right on the crease. And obviously at work all day, I'm lifting and moving toilets and boilers and water heaters and everything else. Do double S to get you. I got through them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, as much as the ads are a pain in the ass, watching them is... Uh, what generates what little bit of income this channel makes. Uh, this channel makes about $35 to $40 a month from the ads. Um, so that's, it's not a lot, but it's something uh, that goes towards, you know, you guys that are members uh, really help the channel. I, I get more out of that than I do out of, out of all the advertising. Super Chats is probably the most profitable thing on the channel, but obviously that only happens when you go live and when people decide to do them. Um, but when those happen and those happen with frequency, that's, that's really where you do. Okay. Um, yeah, that's why, hello Val. Uh, that's why I try to, uh, to post things as many places as I can. Glad to catch you live. Howdy from Texas. Thank you, Calvin. Um, I think we got everybody said hello and all of that. Thank you guys who have hit the like button. And also I got no notifications I saw on Insta. Yeah, um, I know sometimes it, it cause I obviously I follow people and I have all notifications turned on and I'll see a video in my subscription feed where I haven't got a notification, watch it. And like a day later I get a notification and it's like, what the F and, uh, holy shit, Mike, thank you very much. Beat your ad, ad revenue for the month. Yes, you did. Although YouTube takes 30% of that. Um, but still, uh, they take, uh, 45% of ad revenue. So uh, thank you very much, Mike. Much appreciated. Um, Mike uh, obviously made a live stream in person one time and uh, he has a couple of snakes from me. Um, from uh, Orion to Lilith. Um, he has my dark uh, hold back side swipe female I sold to, to Mike and then he's got another one. If you guys follow him on Instagram, uh, he has uh, lots of stuff on there. Uh, what is it? Biomancer Reptiles, I believe, is the one that's more reptile oriented, although, I mean, really, they both are because, you know, people like us are, are always, always into the reptiles. I always think about that, like, oh, I should have separate stuff, but it's like, nah, this is what's important to me. So if you want to be around and involved, then you got to put up with the snakes. Uh, that's kind of how I feel about it. So thank you again, Mike. Very, very appreciated. Um, and thank you to all you guys for, for smashing the like button and all that jazz. Also, important announcement today. Today is Mr. Rob Christian's birthday. He's not really a big YouTube person, but I'm, a lot of you guys know him, so make sure you wished him a happy birthday. Um, I can't share anything from my main Facebook account because I'm in Facebook jail for like another hour. Got a 24-hour stint for nothing. Um, somebody, a friend of mine, posted pictures of these new big boots that she got, and we were having a conversation on, on her page and I said, you know, why don't you just kick me in the head with those boots uh, and put me out of my misery as a joke? And uh, I got put in jail for inciting violence. So apparently telling someone to kick me is inciting violence. But that's Facebook. So Zuckerberg put me in jail. Um, and, uh, of course, I appealed it, but they don't get back to you for weeks sometimes. So 24 hours, it, it's over in about an hour. Um, but anyway, last year I made a really great birthday video for Rob. If you didn't see it, um, maybe I can share that later because that was really funny. Got a bunch of you involved um, to do that. Thank you, Adam. And I missed one, so bear with me a second. Much appreciated. Why'd you get Zuck? Oh, I just said, so you're good. Rather give to you than those OnlyFans girls. I mean, I'm way better looking and you got a better chance of seeing butthole here. So there's that. Thank you, Cody. Glad to see you here. Um, 
And so thank you again, Angel, for that. Much appreciated. Uh, I got to meet Angel down in Daytona. Um, and it's funny because Adam, Adam is not all that far from me, but I've never ran into Adam anywhere. Um, you know, we're like literally uh, our, our, our state's touch tips. So, you know. For being frozen to my deck outside, these aren't too bad. The temperature has been up and down so much, I thought for sure they'd be skunked, but we're doing pretty good. Alrighty, so thank you very much, all of you guys. Uh, let's start doing some stuff with some snakes here. Um, Trying to think, this one here is a, a bit on the small side, um, but it's going to be available soon. And I can't remember if it's a male or a female. Um, it just hasn't quite switched over to Frozen Thawed yet, and I won't sell anything until I switch it over. Um, so it's, it's been eating live, and uh, when I was sick with the Rona, obviously I was not able to get out and get live food. So um, between the flu and the Rona, that was like three weeks where I didn't get an opportunity to feed this poor little one. I think it's a male because it was a male-heavy clutch, but I don't remember for sure. Um, I got to go back and check my records on this one. Um, but super, super calm, baby. Uh, really easy to handle. You can move around, do whatever you got to do. Uh, you can see the tongue flicks pick up as it's getting stimulated, but nothing defensive at all with this animal. Um, it's from my T-positive 007 to uh, my, my Raiden, my Matrix, uh, T-positive Matrix. Um, don't think that particular baby is a Matrix, could be. Uh, I'll just end up selling it as a T-positive. Uh, I'll figure out what it is, male or female, but that is an animal that you know, you could put a deposit on now. It is feeding and, and it eats every time I give it live, but it just hasn't switched over to frozen yet. Um, and part of that was the delay of, of me getting sick and all that and whatever else. But obviously you can see significantly smaller than his siblings. Um, let's see if my miserable girl will come out and tolerate us for a few minutes here. I gotta see where her head's at. Hi. I don't want to scare you, nor do I want to take a food response. Don't start racing around. No, 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 you're going to spill your water. Come on. So here's here's his sister. You can see she's much larger. Uh, she's been eating from day one. This this girl uh, is not shy about food. Switched to Frozen Thought, I think, by her second or third meal. Uh, so that's my T-positive golden eye. She's my hold back from that clutch. But just to show you that he is a little on the small side. Um, but with the weather, I can't ship now anyhow. Uh, so that gives me an opportunity to uh, keep working on the frozen thawed, get a bunch more meals. Probably not going to be able to ship for a month or two, um, maybe a little bit longer. So it gives me plenty of time to do that. But at least the animal's feeding steady every time offered, and uh, we'll get it there. So keep that in mind. Uh, let me make sure I'm getting everybody here. Yakking a lot. dun da 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 Going to Daytona again this year. I can get my Ultra Borneo off. I can't get your Ultra Borneo off live. Um, so I've done a video on here on switching over. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one. Might be worth watching. Maybe you'll you'll pick up a tip that you haven't tried yet. Um, I usually don't have any trouble. This is this is probably about as much trouble as I've had in years. And honestly, it's it's as much on me as it is on the snake. Uh, I haven't been consistent enough with stuff going on in my life. Um, for the way that I usually throw it at them when they give me a little bit of trouble. Um, and I could also do a few things enclosure wise, change it up. That'll make the animal more likely to, um, to go for that stuff. Cause that, that's the whole thing. The more comfortable they are in their cage, uh, the better feeders they are. Um, and that animal's not high strung, but he does go underneath his water dish quite often. So, you know, changing the, the setup a little bit, maybe giving him a little bit more cover might make him more apt. And more comfortable. I also haven't left Frozen Thawed in there uh, like overnight, uh, which I need to do. And I also have to pick up some frozen mice. So he's been eating mouse hoppers and I'm trying to switch to frozen rats. So it's also prey type and style. So I'm asking a lot, um, which most of mine do with ease, especially starting them young. Um, but I just, uh, that one did not want to do that. So I've got to get some small, small enough mice that are frozen that he can take. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Ah, uh, it's okay. Yak away, my guy. We appreciate you. Thanks. I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys very much. Uh, but yeah, definitely check that out, Angel, if you haven't. Um, you can always message me and tell me 
you know, what you've done or whatever else. And I can, I can see if there's anything maybe that I see. Um, but that's why typically I try to make sure they're unfrozen before they leave here so that people don't have a problem. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want people to ever be in a situation where they can't get live food and their their snake's starving or something like that. And the snake's picky. Um, it's, it's not what I'm breeding for. I don't breed any picky feeders. Um, you know, if, if a snake has to be assist fed, um, I would never breed it myself. I'm not judging people that do, but, um, you know, just like other behavioral habits and other traits, uh, both physically and personality wise, things like that can pass down. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm always careful with what I'm pairing up because my goal is to make the best pets that I can, as well as, you know, color and, and all that stuff. But I want people to enjoy these animals and, uh, nicer your animals are, the more you'll enjoy them. So if the animal's a pain in the ass and it sucks, then it's really not that enjoyable. Like my T-positive ivory female, not enjoyable. Uh, every time I have to clean her, I'm just like, oh, really? I wish this was not happening right now. Hey, hey, Josh. Um, what do you feed your hatchling straight out of the egg? So it depends. Both T positive ivories would not take live under any circumstance ever, not once. So they went to frozen thawed right out of the egg. Um, and I, I always try live like the first two meals just to get some meals in them. And then I start switching to frozen usually. Um, you know, some people like to go to frozen right out of the gate and you can do that and you can have success, but it's a more work B, more time, and, and C, there's a little bit smaller chance of success. Those mouse hoppers that move around a lot are even a little bit larger for these guys. Um, you know, decent size like blood hatchlings like that. That Also, that, that male's a little, or I think it's a male anyway, I think is a little behind, not just because of the slower start, but also hatched out smaller. Um, the T-positive 007s and the, uh, my female golden eye hatched out huge. Some of the biggest bloods I've ever hatched. Um, those, those three that I have now and the one T positive 007 that I sold already, uh, to Keith, um, they, uh, they were some of the biggest babies I've, I've ever hatched. So they, they hit the ground running. They were almost too big for a six quart out of the egg, um, which doesn't happen very often. So they actually fed on small adult mice, uh, to start. But obviously starting with something like a small adult mouse, you got to watch more. You got to make sure that that prey item is hydrated. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons that rodents go after, uh, snakes when you put them in there, uh, if they're live is because they're either dehydrated or they're hungry. So you want to make sure if you're keeping feeders for a few days or whatever, before you feed, or even if you got them from somewhere else and you're not sure how they're being kept, feed them, water them, make sure they have everything they need before you throw it in with the snake, much, much lower chance of your snake taking a whack and getting bit. Uh, and then obviously be vigilant and pay attention. Um, so I will turn the lights out and just turn the flash on on my phone or the light on my phone and have that in here and I'll watch, um, with prey that size. Hoppers, you don't have to worry as much. They, they really don't have much in the way of teeth, uh, typically depending on the size you're getting. So pay attention to that. Um, but a lot of times babies will go after a slightly larger meal than you expect better than they'll go after a smaller one. Um, some reasons we don't really know why that is. Um, although I got to imagine naturally how often does a baby hatchling just happen to be around a, a pinky mouse or a, a foot, like, you know, they're the ones that they're going to come across or are going to come be moving past where they're, they're set up to ambush are going to be a little bit larger. And so I think that's more natural. And I think that initial movement is what really triggers them and their food response when they're first going. So the older that prey item is and the larger it is, typically the more active it is, the more apt it is to move around, catch the snake's attention, and maybe even irritate them at times. Sometimes that really helps. Getting them annoyed will actually get you a better food response um, because once they bite, their instinct is to wrap, and once they kill it, their instinct is typically to eat it. So you're kind of just triggering the whole cycle there. Um, let's see. Almost four feet long a year. There's simply no way of power feeding. Can't even get that big in a year. Um, well, for 40 inches, I mean, it's possible. I, uh, I don't grow mine that much. That T-positive ivory I had out earlier is two years old. He's on the small side. Um, his siblings are definitely bigger. Uh, like I said, his sister's a little bit bigger, and then other people that I've sold them to are bigger. I feed really, really light. 
Um, I don't like to feed heavy. I have plenty of food in the freezer. It's not anything to do with that. It's just these animals do so much with so little. And in captivity, they're even less active than they would be naturally. I mean, they're already a natural, very, very sedentary animal. Um, so I would rather err on the side of caution always. You can always bump up feeding and catch a snake up in weight. Taking weight off of them is a lot more difficult. Um, and especially because the biggest pe mistake people make is once a snake is overweight or obese, they just take it off of food for long periods of time. And what happens is, same thing when you go on a crash diet and starve yourself, your body slows its metabolism down and stores everything that it can because it doesn't know when it's gonna get a meal again. So what you have to do is way downside the meal size, stretch out the frequency a little bit, but you still have to feed at a semi-regular pace. And so it's a lot harder and takes a lot longer to get that weight off than where if you need to catch an animal up in weight, just normal appropriate feedings for that animal will catch it up in, in before you know it. Um, and, and I see that mistake made a lot too, where people buy an animal they feel is too skinny, or maybe they take on a rescue uh, that was emaciated. They wanna throw so much food at it. One, the, the animal hasn't been getting fed properly, so its system is not used to a constant barrage of food. So if you do that too quickly, you're shocking their system and gonna cause issues in that way. Um, Whereas if you just give them steady, normal meals, and, and when it's an emaciated animal or underweight, I actually start with smaller meals. I want them to get their system rolling. Even my females, after they lay eggs and have been off of food for several months sometimes, I'll start them with a much smaller meal than they usually eat the first time, get that metabolism rolling again, and then we'll go to a more, a more traditional meal the following, uh, the following one. So like my big girls will get like a medium rat my adults when they come off of, of, you know, laying eggs, they'll get a medium rat. And then five to seven days later, they'll get a normal size meal. And then we'll get them into a normal rotation of every, you know, two, three weeks, whatever it is that we're doing, maybe a little bit more frequent. The first couple, just as they're recovering really depends on how they look after they lay. Uh, some females come off eggs looking like they're ready to breed again. Some come off eggs looking like a bag of bones. Um, it all depends on how they were going in, how much of their, their body storage turns into eggs, um, all of that factors in. So there's no cut and dry with any of that stuff, but you've really got to manage it appropriately for the animals. So before this video drags forever and ever, let's start pairing some snakes up. So pain in the ass Lilith here. Um, who for whatever reason is in like a super, super mood. Uh, so I'm just gonna watch myself here. Hi. Um, she's, she's got some stuck shed, which, you know, happens this time of year, which is annoying. But um, she's in like a super, super food mode for whatever reason. Uh, still a sweetheart, but um, she's just much more food. Um, I don't know what the word is. I don't want aggressive. Um, Food motivated, I guess, would be the right way to go. So, whereas normally she might have a lower food response, and I already had her out a little while ago, so she's not as bad as she was earlier. But earlier she was like, "Feed me, fat guy," um, which is good because I, you know, I think she's trying to get her body rolling um, to go ahead and start pushing for some eggs. Do you have a plan to work with the side swipe gene? I mean, the side swipe gene, uh, you'll see in just a second because we're about to pair him up. Uh, that's the bulk of what I breed in Borneos. Um, almost every Borneo I've produced came from some side swipe lineage. I think I've done one or two Borneo clutches that didn't involve side swipe over the last, uh, five, six years, whatever it is. So yeah, definitely you'll see uh, a couple of side swipes here. Uh, we're going to pair up three side swipe males as a matter of fact, during this video, so long as they're not in shed, uh, which I assume they're not. Fly, eagles, fly. The eagles got grounded. I'm sorry to hear that, uh, but uh, you're welcome for uploading. Appreciate you stopping in. Driven, driven would be a good one as well. I mean, it's certainly possible. The thing is, I gotta watch Lilith. She's about to leave her, her tub look, looking for food. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of factors that go in and genetics plays a huge role in how fast these snakes grow. So people that have bred snakes and raised a lot of them can tell you 
There's some snakes that you can throw food at and do, 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 they barely grow. There's other snakes that you barely feed and you're like, what the hell, this thing's adult size in like two years. Um, so genetics plays a huge factor. And that's one thing that not many people have really gone after and worked on, trying to make the largest animals, smaller animals. I mean, they have obviously with like super dwarf retics, but with bloods and short tails, I haven't seen a lot of people doing projects where they're going after smaller or larger animals. Um, I can say Big Red, her babies tended to grow really fast, but now Ronnie's not very big. You know, Ron, Ronnie here, Ronnie Burgundy is her, her daughter, who was supposed to be a male, but not so much. Um, so, so far, so, so nothing with that. Would you rather jump off a 74 story building or a 75 story building? Hi, TBNR frog. Um, you know, I don't think it really matters at that point, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, your fall rate's going to be the same. At that distance, I don't think the extra few feet really makes any difference unless you have a lot of last thoughts you want to go through. But when I was really sick and uh, I really, really thought I might be going, didn't really have a lot running through my mind, just getting taken care of the animals. Like one person crossed my mind, um, you know, and uh, I didn't even reach out to them because I just said, nah, not worth it. If it happens, it happens. So I didn't really have a bunch of stuff cycle through for me. So I don't know if it would change if I was falling off a building. So that extra story, I guess, would get you maybe a, a quarter of an extra thought. Uh, so let's grab her boyfriend, du jour, for this year. Hi, bud. What's up? Yeah, talk to me, talk to the people. This is Mr. Atlas. Uh, he is a side swipe, also featuring the seasonal stuck shed. His is literally just a little strip that would probably just pull right off, but he gets cranky sometimes, so I don't usually mess with him too much like that, um, like I could with some of my other kids. But yeah, he, uh, he side swipe. He is uh, actually Lilith is his mother, um, so this is the first season I'm really doing any any closely related pairings. But in this particular case, that gray stripe that you see up top um, is really the target for this clutch. Lilith throws a lot of those babies, so I'm putting him back to her to see how much of that we can pull out and uh, how that does with her. And um, he's also breeding Callisto this year as well. Um, she, they were paired up the last time, so this time he's going to go in with Lilith now that she shed. Um, I don't often do two females with one male, uh, but this, this season I am letting him do that. His father uh, was a fantastic breeder um, and could handle multiple females uh, very well, but you have to manage them. Uh, I'm not recommending that you do that. One to one is your best ratio and best chance to have success. Uh, these guys are not like ball pythons. A ball python male done right could do four or five females and be effective and have good fertility. These guys don't seem to be as potent like that. Uh, they wear out a little bit more if you if you overbreed them. Um, the nice thing is they typically stay feeding. Like, you know, Atlas just ate three, four days ago, same as Lilith did. Um, he doesn't pull off of food. None of my males do at all. Um, I've had one male ever that didn't eat during breeding season. Uh, and that was it. Everything else has always stayed on food uh, for all the species that I have currently. Um, but anyhow, so I lost my train of thought completely. Hi, Will. He's already smelling her. Um, oh, so we're talking about multiple males uh, or multiple females. So you don't want to do multiple males for sure. Um, because lineage is everything with blood and short tail pythons. And if you don't know who the daddy is, um, then you don't know the lineage and the animal is, um, you know, essentially worthless to anybody that really cares about the lineage of their projects and developing it and working with certain things. Um, I'll turn you guys for a second. You can, uh, can see he's heading over to court her already. She obviously went for a little dip in her water dish earlier, so... That's why that's all wet over there, because I actually cleaned her earlier tonight. Um, but 
water is not a big deal. These are swampy snakes, so that's not going to bother them at all, and they're probably going to piss all over the place anyways. But anyhow, so what I do to manage my males is if I am doing multiples, I look at it on how many locks that male is going to do in a whole season. Um, and I don't want them locking over 10 times in a season ever. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of wear and tear in their body. Uh, so if they're going to do multiple females, he's going to have to get one of them early on. Uh, this will be his third time paired up with Lilith, and he's been paired with Callisto twice. So he's only at five. Um, and that's five, assuming they lock, which chances are they will by tomorrow morning. Um, he's already on her pretty good as far as he's interested, she's interested. Um, they're a very compatible pair, meaning that they get along very well. Um, they'll spend a lot of time together when they're paired up. They breed very fantastically. Um, so they're, they're very, very compatible. If you could work with a colubrid species as a second breeding project, what would it be? Um, colubrids are not my passion. Um, I don't know what I would breed if I did colubrids. I guess maybe Honduran milks. Um, I do have an appreciation for hondos, even though they're tapped in the head. And very, very unpredictable temperament-wise. And not animal to animal, but I mean, you can hatch out a clutch and five can be wonderful and five can be batshit crazy. Um, it doesn't seem where you can really work with lineage like you can with these guys and, and kind of consistently get results as far as temperament goes. But hondos I, I've always liked. What's your opinion on blah? I don't like hybrids at all. Um, so that one's really easy. Um, as far as hybrids I hate the most, it's people that put bloods to short tails and short tails to other short tail species. Uh, you cannot hybridize within these three at all. Um, it makes it really muddy, really difficult to know what you have, especially once you breed back to the parent species and stuff gets really muddied. Um, it's, it's, it's no bueno. Um, we see it every, every day. People are like, this is my new blood, my new Borneo, whatever, and it's a hybrid. And, you know, they got duped. And then you see people trying to sell these hybrids for all this money, which first of all, it is extremely easy to make blood and short tail hybrids with each other if you want to. They, they, they're very compatible in that way. Um, it's not difficult, so why these people think it's worth money to make a snake that looks uglier than both parent species, I don't understand. Um, and I don't know why you'd want to suppress the wonderful personalities and intelligence of these snakes with the ball pythons that, you know, just don't quite level out with that. Um, not, not my thing. To each their own. Uh, yeah, Kribos definitely um, are disgusting animals. A lot of colubrid species, like, and it's funny because people be like, oh my God, blood smells so bad. I, you get used to it, I suppose. But to me, like pine snakes and even large groups of king snakes and Kribos and things like that smell far more offensive to me than, than these do. Um, plus those go to the bathroom constantly. Uh, at least these guys are only pooping once a month, once every two or three months, depending, whatever. We're going to do a video on that eventually when I get some time to actually sit down and do the video I want to do with that um, and talk about my take on why that happens and how to prevent them holding it for so long. I, knock on wood, have never had any hold it that long. Um, and so I have my thoughts as to why. I think I haven't had that problem compared to others, so I'm going to get into that when we shoot that video, so I'm not going to do that now. Uh, boom slangs, the bestest, sweetest colubrids. All different species. What age can a male and female breed? I'm sorry I'm missing some of these chats. There's a lot coming in. Are marble and granite the same gene? I love marble, but can't find it for sale. If you're looking for marbles, talk to Matt Minatola first and foremost. Um, he has the nicest marbles you will ever see. Um, I am not pairing up anything marble this year, um, possibly next season, depending on if my female's ready or not, I will. Um, but right now, nothing, nothing on the, on the slate for me, but Matt Minnetola is the, the place to start for those. And right now there's not much for sale because you're, 
you're at the point in the season where everything's breeding. Any babies that are available are left over from last year. Um, people might be getting eggs on the ground sooner than later, um, but you're still probably two to four months away um, before you really start seeing babies come available and then all through the summer. Um, but I would talk to him uh, because if you want a truly nice marble, if he's got a waiting list, jump on there. Uh, at least take a look, uh, worth every penny from him for sure. And, and you can't find a nicer guy than Matt either. Uh, and so that helps who, who you buy from when you buy a snake, you're investing in not only that snake for yourself and your projects and what it can do for you, but you're also investing in that person. And so if you're investing in people that are good for the hobby, people like Matt are good for the hobby. Um, they take it seriously. They care about the animals. They're good with customers or good with everything. Um, so when you support those people, you're making a better hobby. When you support people that don't give a shit and do stupid stuff and whatnot, then you're voting with your dollars if that's what you're, where you want the hobby to head, and then we continue down the dark road we're on now. Speaking of which, important thing that I was going to mention, there's always a link to US Arc in my videos. There's a link here. Uh, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., there is a Zoom call uh, for North Carolina. Extremely important. Uh, go to that link. There's a link right on the US Arc page where you can sign up for it so you can be involved in that. Um, if you are going to speak during the Zoom meeting, be courteous, be professional, and, and not overly emotional. Look at it from the point of view of the science and why what they're doing is bad. Uh, they're outright banning, are looking to outright ban all tegu species, um, as well as changing the permit requirements for importation of native species. Uh, so that means if you're moving there with a bunch of corn snakes or something like that, then now you're going to have to file for permits and do all this stuff uh, just to bring them into the state, uh, even though they're captive bred and were never in the wild. Um, so that one, while it's frustrating and kind of dumb, is not as big of a deal as the tegu end of things because they're out looking to outright ban all the species. There is zero science that says those animals can survive there. Um, Josh was on Reptile Talk with Rob and Jeremy recently discussing it. And uh, he pointed out that the study that they've used to try to ban these animals, which they did successfully in South Carolina and in Florida, um, that model shows that they can't survive in that state except for a very, very narrow sliver on the southern coast. And I mean narrow. Um, you know, he estimated it's less than 5% of the state, and I even think that he's kind of going over with that. Um, it's a really small area. So... If you can, 7 p.m. tomorrow, sign up for that. Um, even if you don't speak, just showing up. Uh, more people, more boxes, showing interest in what's going on. Um, we'll let them know that maybe this is something they shouldn't be messing with. If you are from North Carolina, or if you know reptile keepers in North Carolina, reach out to them, make sure they are involved, make sure that they speak up and say that they are constituents in that state and that they do not like this because there's no danger to humans from tegus and there's no danger to wildlife because they can't survive there. So it's absolute shit that they're trying to ban them uh, statewide. There's just there's just no reason for it whatsoever. Uh, Josh is one of the most successful people I know with tegus, and he's in South Carolina, and he has to bring his animals in uh, seasonally, and some of them earlier than others, uh, because they will not survive. And he's way south of North Carolina. So, um, you know... Uh, every single person, um, there's people in other countries, everybody agrees that there's no way these animals can survive there, but yet they're going to try to say that they're a danger to local wildlife. So get involved with that stuff. If you're not following US Arc, I don't know why you're not, uh, but you should be. Even if you're not a member, which you should also be, at least follow them, get the newsletter, be aware of what's going on. It's an email here and there. They don't spam you with shit. Um, you get the action alerts. You know everything that's going on. Uh, if not, periodically check their website and see what's going on, get involved. I believe you can also write and submit stuff in writing for this. Uh, but it's really important that people show up for this because originally there was going to be three meetings on this subject. Two in person, one Zoom. Now they, they've cited the COVID thing, whatever, uh, to get out of the two in person meetings. And they did not reschedule them for Zoom. So this is the one and only shot which already tells you that they don't really give a shit what people have to say and they don't want to make it convenient. They had already blocked out that time to do this and now they're, they're skipping on two out of the three. So it is important that we show up and show out and let them know um,
because we've already lost Florida, we've already lost South Carolina. If we lose North Carolina, how long before Georgia and other states in that area? I think even Alabama has gone after some stuff. Um, I'm not as abreast of everything with tegus as I am with snakes, but it's still important to be very aware of what's going on right now. Um, and it's, it's that time of year where politicians are starting to push stuff through. This is their, their session coming up for the next few months, so we're going to get hammered with legislation again like we did last year. So, um, and right now, from, from the grapevine, what Phil has said, other things going on, Phil being Phil from US Arc, uh, it's looking like it's going to be a fucking wild ride again this year. So we need to buckle up. We need to put our foot down and show them that this is a problem. Also, something that really is important, especially right now with the Betty White thing and her passing and people giving to animal charities, make sure you talk to people and let them know not to be giving to the, the Humane Society of the United States. Explain to them, share things that let them know that that, that money does not go towards helping shelter animals. 1%. 1% of that money goes towards that, which is just enough for them to legally claim that that's what they're doing. And all that money is going to lobbying against us, lobbying against pet ownership. They have been on the record many, many times saying that no one should own pets. Pets, period. That's dogs, cats, birds, everything. Everything. Fish, you name it. They don't want you to have anything. They don't believe animals should be in captivity at all. Uh, they have said several times that dogs should be uh, out free living their natural life. Um, but yet at the same time, if you put your dog out when it's too cold, you're the first people to come after you, even if you have a Siberian Husky telling you it shouldn't be out because it's too cold. So I don't know what they think their natural life's going to be when it's winter time, if they, they're going to suddenly hibernate. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a, it's a whack thing on their mind. So make sure, um, because no matter how much money we raise for us arc, um, they have so much more money and power than us. Uh, so the, if we can cut their funding by making people aware of what they're giving to, that's going to do just as much as us pumping U.S. ARC up, which we still need to do. But uh, we really have to focus on that, too, because that is something that they're, they're a juggernaut. They have their commercials with the sad faces and the songs and people will die and they leave money to them in their will and, and all this stuff. And we've got to stop that. Your local animal shelters, if you want to give to stuff like that, absolutely. Give directly to them. Uh, they don't like the Humane Society umbrella because it doesn't help them. And so your local Humane Society is not the Humane Society of the United States. Don't get those two mixed up. Um, so if you're going to donate, go local. Uh, even your local SPCA is better than that. They're not even, they're, they're a little touch and go, but they're certainly better than uh, the Humane Society or something like PETA as well. Um, who doesn't want to see any animals in captivity, no pets, no nothing. Plus, they kill more shelter animals than anybody. I think I pay $40 a year to U.S. Arc. Yeah, that, that's all it is. Um, I mean, there's there's bigger plans, uh, but that, that one helps. Because the thing is, the money is, is good, but the number of members is so crucial because that shows the power, the strength in numbers. So millions of dollars raised is great and wonderful, but we need more members. And so they can go and say, this is how many people are keeping these animals. This is how many people are passionate about these animals. And people in other countries understand this and join US Arc, even though US Arc has nothing to do with Canada, Australia, people from Europe, all over. So if you're in the US and you're keeping reptiles or you even like reptiles or you're keeping pets, to not pay $40 a year, you get a t-shirt, a t-shirt at the store is 20 bucks anyways. So $20 a year uh, to support an organization that's keeping you aware of what's going on. Because let me tell you, if U.S. Arc disappeared, would you know that North Carolina was going after tegus right now? Would you have known about South Carolina? Would you have known about what's going on in Florida? Would you have known about when uh, Illinois was looking to do what would have killed Tinley? And, and um, all these bans on, on presenting animals in classrooms and, and banning education, you wouldn't know about all this stuff without them. Uh, that's how the reptile community stays abreast. So for $20 a year, essentially, uh, because you're getting a shirt, um, you know, you support the organization that is helping you be aware of what's going on and fighting against that legislation. Um, so keep on that, write those letters, do all those things you need to do seven o'clock tomorrow. Let's get back to the snakes. I don't want to hammer on that for too long. Don't forget if you're here, uh, hit that like button. Uh, I got 25 total likes, but we got 31 people in here right now. Uh, so we're way, we're way low. If you haven't hit that yet, please do, uh, help with the algorithm. I appreciate it. 
Tigus are a danger to wildlife, then why weren't house cats banned? Yeah. So see, the whole thing is, it's it's not about what's truly dangerous. Um, and house cats are, are truly dangerous. They're probably the most dangerous animal that's out there as far as wildlife goes. Uh, they're already responsible for the extinction of, of, you know, two dozen species and pushing so many more to the brink. Um, but do you know how many cat ladies would go ape shit if they went after cats? The pushback would be so immense. And so if they started with the actual problem, um, you know, cats, feral pigs, things that do a lot of damage, you know, if you do feral pigs, well, all these farmers are going to go after you and they know these, these industries depend on that and we depend on it as a food source. So what they are doing is going after the obscure because they can, because we don't have as much of a unified front. We don't have the numbers. Uh, so you start small, you get precedent set. And once precedents are set, it's so much easier to just go through and create legislation without and where you can circumvent the process of dealing with the public. Uh, because now you can, you can get these laws passed and then you can add things to them without having to go through the same channels as you might. Um, and that's why some of the legislation down in South Carolina as well, when they were talking about the venomous stuff, was so concerning because they slipped that in last minute on a bill totally unrelated to animals or anything. Nothing to do with it. They slipped it in on page, you know, whatever, 64 or 38, whatever, stuffed it down in there, and they were going to ban that. And once again, without the people that US ARC works with and without the funding that they get and the memberships that we have, they wouldn't have been able to make us aware of that, and that would have passed, and there would have been nothing we could do. Um, fortunately, there was enough pushback where they, they tabled it, um, and that's what we need. So let me, uh, let me close these two up here because they're probably wondering what the hell is going on interrupting their their happy day all right thank you guys i see three more of you hit the like button much appreciated those of you that have stuck around this far i'm going to take out one of my favorite animals um let me just close this Boop. hit a little hand sanitizer in my cut for good luck and whew, that one stung give myself a little drinky poo all right Oop. what's oops uh-oh hit the wrong button hang on hold on uh what size tubs are those where did you buy them which tubs are you looking at are you looking at the ars tubs or are you looking at the christmas tree tubs uh let me know the uh the ars tubs are essentially about the size of a 41 quart i don't know the exact dimensions on those uh Definitely more for sub-adults or very small adults. I don't recommend that for anything uh, much larger than Atlas, really. Orion, who we'll pull out in a bit, is, is in there now, but he's probably a little bit too big, um, and I actually am planning on moving him shortly. Uh, the tree bins. So the tree bins are a little bit different. The one down here, uh, this is the VE-175 by Iris. Uh, these are about 52 inches long. Uh, by about 21 and a half inches wide. Um, I think they're 14 tall off the top of my head, but height is, doesn't really factor in much when it comes to bloods and short tails. They're not climbers, um, and they're, they really shouldn't climb. It's not great for them. Um, I would never, ever keep them in an enclosure that exceeds two feet tall. Um, you're just asking for trouble. But um, these ones, I don't like the dimensions as much. These are the Sterilite version. And I don't know, I peeled off all the stickers that had the dimensions. They're around the same length, but they are a little bit narrower. And so that's why I have smaller animals in these ones for right now. Uh, these are animals that just bumped up into adult enclosures in um, Astra, Voodoo Queen, and one of my skunk line girls here. Uh, thank you, Adam. I just saw that, that rifle by real quick there. Um... Appreciate that. My phone is dying, homies. Tell Dan I love him and to take this sticker. Mandy, welcome. Uh, so I, I don't know what the dimensions on these are, but they're called like infrared tree boxes by Sterilite. You can Google it. Um, I don't remember the model off offhand beyond that. I know the, the Iris ones because that's what I've used for years, but uh, Walmart's no longer carrying those. They're carrying the Sterilite ones now. Um, so I had to get these. They're also taller. So they don't fit on the racking that I used to use. 
So right now, the only one that's over there is up top that Ronnie Burgundy's in. Um, but they're significantly taller, I would say two to four inches. I'm, I'm down on an angle, so it's hard to tell. But about two to four inches taller, so it makes a difference because these Christmas tree tubs, the iris ones, just fit into what I'm using over here. Let me turn so you can see. Um, so you see how they just fit? And then up top, uh, I can't see, uh, but that one, the red top, is a little bit taller than the green top. Um, and that's that's where Ronnie's at um, in there. And you can see I have stickers on certain tubs of snakes that have their own stickers. So like Atlas has his own sticker. Uh, Ronnie does. Um, Voodoo Queen does. Uh, so anything that I have merch for, which there's a link for uh, as well down below for those designs, uh, they have their own uh, stickers. So let's get this, this lady out here and we'll, we're going to pair her up. Hi, what are you doing? Are you so thrilled? This is the enrichment tub. How much fun have you had? Probably more than is allowed. Oh, fuck, you're heavy. This is my lovely, lovely tea positive lady here. I'll try to get her held a little different. Very, very large lady. Uh, six foot eight, last measure. Um, she's about 30 pounds, but she gets much heavier when you're holding her for a while, just because of their muscle and how they move around and everything like that. Um, very, very sweet animal, thankfully. Uh, a blood this big that wasn't sweet would be quite a task. Obviously, I put her in the picture of the video. Um, I thought it would be cool to have her on there because she just looks so damn pretty, and I love her. And I made you guys all wait for a while to see her, so you got to earn it, those of you that have hung around. If you haven't hit that like button yet and you like her, let me know. Hit that like button. She also accepts Super Chat, so don't be shy. Girls love to be spoiled. You send her your credit card, she'll use it, I promise. Uh, just a wonderful girl. Uh, I enjoy her very much. Um, people often ask, like, oh, you allow them in your face? Like, I, I trust her completely. Um, if I didn't, I wouldn't. This is a big animal. Obviously, I don't let her crawl around my neck. Um, just on the off chance she gets spooked, uh, it's no good. I'm gonna move her right now, though, because she gets heavy, as I said. And let me get her bluff friend. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Just gotta make sure she doesn't wander off on me. Uh, I will show you her boyfriend quickly. He is not my biggest fan, uh, so it is very short lived that I can maneuver him around. Bud? Hi, hey, bud. It's okay. Yeah, he's already vocalizing and tail wagging and all that, so we're gonna move him kind of quick. This is my T-positive 007, Selective Origins. Um, he is the father of the uh, little baby I showed you earlier, my golden eye holdback. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and put him in here with her. So far this year, they haven't really done much that I've seen, uh, but he's a very, very sneaky breeder. Um, I, he only locked Raiden once last year and got the job done. Um, so I'm going to keep pairing and keep trying, um, probably for another month. And uh, after that, we'll call it a year. And if they don't take, they don't take. Um, then we just get her ready for next year and uh, try it again. But there's a chance that he locked her up and I didn't see it. I saw a little bit of courting behavior with them. Um, so it, it's possible. I saw that I missed something. I apologize. Give me a second. Oh, keep forgetting about that cut. It gets me every time. Dun da da dun da da da. Thank you, Angel, for the thickness, oh Lord. Uh, I appreciate that. Is she your biggest short tail? Absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, um, definitely biggest. Yeah, the, the tree tubs are great. Um, I, I always say, you know, I'm very open about the fact that she needs something larger. Uh, I do have her out quite a bit, um, which, you know, is not, obviously that setup's not ideal for her period, no excuses, um, but she just really loves it. Um, and I haven't been able to find anything tub wise that's bigger, um, that would accommodate her. She's not the type of snake that wants to be in a cage. 
And so because, you know, essentially that space is not adequate for her all the time, I take her out a little bit more than I do with some of the other stuff, especially during the summer. She's outside with me a lot. Um, we've talked about it in other videos, but allowing these snakes to completely stretch out and stretch that lung and clear those lungs is very important. Um, and so in this setup, she can't do that properly in my opinion. Um, and so I like to get her outside during the summer as much as I can. She's very good out there. She is very confident, enjoys being out there. Um, she's very personable. She'll keep coming back to me. Mandy, I forgot to tell you, thank you very much. I think, uh, for the sticker or super chat. I appreciate that. Big girl needs a name, Dan. I know, she definitely needs a name, and I am so bad at naming snakes. And it's weird, stuff will hatch, and right away I'll have a name picked out, and then other snakes I've had for I don't know how many years that don't have a name, like the Skunk Line Girls I've had since 2015, and I haven't named them. Um, my Golden Eye, I had a name picked out for uh, the moment she hatched, and right before I announced it, I saw somebody else had used the name and I was like, well, now I can't because uh, it's somebody else within the blood community for pretty much the same type of blood python, T, T negative albino versus T positive. But I was going to use Vesper from, uh, you know, James Bond, which actually is what's on TV in my living room right now. I was watching Casino Royale uh, before I came live. Um, but yeah, so that was my initial plan. But April, April Justine, Bloods by Design, named hers that. Um, and I was like, well, damn it, you know, and because she's just far and away my favorite Bond character. Uh, Ava Green as an actress is one of my all time favorites. Um, everything she does is just fantastic. Um, from even not so significant roles, maybe in. Um, holy shit. I'm blanking. I'm blanking. Movie with Orlando Bloom, and then The Knights. Um, God damn it. It's one of my favorite movies, too, and the DVD sitting upstairs in my bedroom right now. And I just, I am blanking. Kingdom of Heaven. So she's brilliant in that. Penny Dreadful, one of my favorite shows of all time. She's brilliant in that. Even her role in 300, she was very good. Um, just always liked Ava Green. And what I love the most, and what I like about actors and actresses, is people that are so outside themselves in character, but yet so believable. She is a completely like reclusive, shy person. Um, she's not like confident at all in her body and all these things. And, and she loves to just sit home in her apartment and, and, and place by herself and, and, you know, things like that. And, but yet she's such this big personality and, and whatever. And uh, so I, I've always appreciated that. But, so that's why I wanted to name her that, but I just didn't feel good about it after I saw it. And I try not to recycle names either. Beauty is like five months old. Yeah, it happens, you know? It's hard to do it. I gotta go over here. I'm blocking the thing. Probably obnoxious. My carp python is named Cujo for good reason. Baby carpets can be terrible. All mine have horror murder themes. Damn, why are my bloods queer? That I don't know. I have ten snakes and only four have names. I'm bad at names also. Yeah, you don't have much excuse with only ten. Veronica. She looks like a Veronica. That's actually not a bad name. Are you cool with us sharing our Instagram handles? You guys can share whatever you want in the comments. Uh, as long as it is, uh, you know, appropriate, not like rapey or anything to anybody. You know, don't be like, hey, you, great tits. No, let's not do that. Um, you can tell me I'm great tits because I know, but, you know, otherwise, let's not do that. But yeah, by all means, I'm not... I'm not one of those people, um, especially for you guys that I know and talk to all the time and everything else and, and whatever, I don't care. Um, you know, there are certain things that cross lines and I'm not one that gets that upset about it, but I see it sometimes where somebody posts something about, you know, this is a snake I'm looking to move and somebody will post underneath to somebody else looking, oh, talk to me, I have something for sale. Like, that's pretty rude. Um, you know, people have done it to me and I don't really say anything about it, but I would never do that to somebody else. Um, you know, things like that. But yeah, share, share away, you know, cross your socials, get some followers. Um, you know, I appreciate when you guys share my stuff and, uh, and all that. So, you know, when you guys share these videos on, on your social platforms um, and push it out or mention it, you know, even if it gets one or two views from that, every view pushes that algorithm out further and further. Every time you guys hit the like button, 
Uh, once again, 31 likes, 30 people in here. I know some people have had to go, so I know there's some of you in here that haven't hit the like button yet. So what is it that you don't like? Uh, tell me so we can fix it. We can get you hammering that like button, pushing that algorithm out. Um, yeah, so, so Tim, for instance, imagine like... Um, I was selling a T positive 007 and I put up an ad or whatever and somebody put on there, oh, I'm looking for a, a, a normal blood python or whatever, blah, 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 blah. And then somebody just jumps on, oh, I have one, message me. Now, if I don't have the animal, I don't have a problem with somebody else um, getting a sale, of course. And I, I push a lot of sales to other people's, to, to Kara, to Matt, to Matt, to Rich, to Kelly, to whoever. Um, but I would rather tell the person, here's the people I recommend since they're coming from my post than just have you jump on there because maybe you're some Facebook friend I don't even know or maybe it's in a group and I don't know you at all and now you're advertising your animals on my post. It makes it look like I'm okay with that. Um, I just think there's certain lines you don't cross with people and I think that's one of them. Um, you know, And I, I see it all the time. Or people will be like, I'm selling this for $1,000 and somebody will message or post on there, well, I have one for 800 like, what the fuck? Like, what? who raised you? Your parents should be embarrassed. You should be embarrassed. My personal Insta is different, but you could follow them. I don't even know if I'm following that one, Tim. I think I just have your personal one on mine or whatever. And sometimes I don't follow people back. Like, if you have, like, three or four posts, I'm not going to follow you back because you're not posting anything. Um... So sometimes I don't follow people back, not because I don't talk to you all the time or whatever, but there's just nothing there. And it's just, why, why do it? Um, it won't let me double like it. What's up, Jack? Welcome. Uh, I know I'm missing a lot of stuff. I ran into that when I tried to move my big guy. Yeah, it's just rude. It doesn't make any sense. Um, girl, Ava. Ava's not a bad name either. Um... Yeah, I'm just, I'm picky about names, and I like different names. That's why I have Voodoo Queen and, um, you know, Callisto. I don't see a lot of Callistos around. So with the Borneos, initially, I was going for a Celestial theme. So I had a Bellatrix, Callisto, Astra, Orion. Um, Dio was an outlier because Dio, Dio and Lilith uh, were the first Borneos I got when I got back into keeping short tails again in 2011. Um... And Dio was, has always been one of my favorite um, singers of all time. And so naturally I had to have a snake named Dio. And then Lilith is just always a name that I've liked. Um, and it's gotten way more popular over the years for sure as time's gone on. I see Lilith everywhere now. Um, not quite to Nagini levels or however you say it. I've never seen Harry Potter, but, um, but definitely out there. Um, the biggest, so, so then my, my Curtis stuff, I wanted all dark, dark names, uh, to do with some kind of darkness or whatever to reflect the dark line of Curtis. So Midnight Rider, you know, Midnight, it's dark out, um, great song. So it worked. Um, Voodoo Queen, enough said, Morticia, enough said, um, the biggest regret I have is I sold one of my holdbacks named Akasha and the person liked the name and kept it. And so I felt like ah, I can't use that name again. And then I had one named Blackfire that I also sold. Um, and she kept that name sort of, uh, Annalie modified it into Onyx Blackfire, I believe, or something like that. Uh, Onyx is it Onyx or is that something else? I don't know. My, my brain's so jumbled with other people's snake names. And then I had, you know, Black Magic, Amina, same thing. All, uh, all within that theme. Blood pythons. Initially, I wanted a red theme. So Ron Burgundy. I had Cheyenne, which in you know certain language meant red. Um, stuff like that. But then you just get to a number of animals, and you kind of hit the wall where there's not names that you really like. Like I'm out of celestial names that I've come across that I like. Um, so that's kind of a dead end. And so now it's just kind of whatever fits. Atlas was spur of the moment um i was making merchandise i'm like i can't make merchandise he doesn't have a name so i had to pick something quickly i went through a few names and I, I atlas you know still 
sort of celestial in a way, not so much, I mean, of the earth, Borneos are, you know, always called brown snakes to people that don't like them, so I figured it was kind of appropriate, and, you know, Atlas is still holding up the world on his, on his shoulders, and so, therefore, he's kind of in space, so it, it kind of fits. Um, unless, of course, you think the earth is flat, and then I guess he's not in space? I don't know. That was a badass name. She's the assassin from Killing Eve. I don't know what Killing Eve is. What about Stella or Stella? No, I have a friend whose last name is Stella, and I would never hear the end of it if I named the snake that. She would give me so much shit. I don't name my snakes. I guess I don't really name any of my reptile. Um, how about Omicron? No, thank you. Uh, looks like a Georgette. The girl I got from you ages before she arrived. You named her ages before she arrived. Yeah, I remember that. Um, sometimes stuff clicks. Like I said, I've had stuff come right out of the egg, and I'm like, this is who this is going to be. Uh, Lilith reminds me of Kevin McCurley. Do I sense thievery? Uh, well, considering Kevin, uh, Kevin's Lilith uh, wasn't even alive when I got my Lilith in 2011, no, I did not steal that from him at all. And uh, very sorry to see that Lilith passed. Um, I don't want to get into that subject on here because I know a lot of people have strong feelings one way or the other. All I can say is I'm very sorry to see her go for sure. She was a beautiful, beautiful, regal animal, uh, absolutely breathtaking in person. Um, you know, just absolutely commanded respect from the moment you locked eyes with her. Uh, very cool animal. I had the, I had the luxury of seeing many times. Um, just, just beautiful, beautiful, Beautiful animal, um, and wonderful animal, even if she was uh, a little bit of a bitch, um, which, you know, is to be expected um, for, you know, being an import and, and a king cobra. Fair. The earth isn't round, a flat earther and proud, oh boy. Um... Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what Killing Eve is. I know a lot of people often give me stuff from like anime and video games and I am not into any of that. So that's all outside of my realm. Yeah, I do too. Um, like I said, I don't want to get into it. And uh, there's definitely some things he could have done better with her. But I don't, I, I don't understand all the hate towards him for stuff. And the one thing I will get into, because it absolutely pisses me off, and I can't say how many times I've started writing it, and I'm like, I'm not even bothering with these people, because people just cannot process information and logic. So everybody, when, you know, Lilith's eye got messed up, was like, why doesn't he take her to the vet? First of all, the only person in the entire state of New Hampshire that is allowed to handle venomous animals with a permit is Kevin and those who are on his permit. Tim, Rob, uh, and that's about it. So with there not being people that keep venomous snakes in that state and there's not a very large population of native venomous anyways, which is still very different from a king cobra, what vet in New Hampshire do you think is qualified, one, and two, wants to deal with a adult female king cobra? I can tell you it's zero. I can also tell you that the vets in Kevin's area come to him when they have snake questions. So when he has a snake issue, he's supposed to go to the people that refer to him because they don't have the knowledge that he does. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, pretty much every state in New England, uh, Connecticut can't have venomous. Rhode Island has one venomous permit issued. Roger Williams Zoo, small zoo, southern end of the state. Um, Massachusetts, I believe, is permit only, and I don't know how many permits are out there, if any. Uh, Vermont is very strict. Maine is very strict. So where is he supposed to take this animal? Is he supposed to like just put her on a jet plane and fly her to some vet in LA? It's just not practical. Uh, not to mention, you have to look at the stress factor of taking her somewhere and doing all of that. Um, and so even if you find a vet that is willing, they may not be qualified. And if you find one that's qualified, they may not be willing. So I think that was a really stupid argument that people had. Um, and... I, I, I get that it's frustrating because that's your first go-to, but the reality is to those people that have kept snakes for long periods of time, my vets locally here ask me questions. Animal control here, when they get snake-related stuff, ask me questions. And I'm not an expert by any means. I've been keeping these animals for a little under two decades. Um, I am not 
close to Kevin's level uh, of stuff. Now, I've done rescue work, so I've done some medical procedures in the past, not on my own animals recently, but obviously on rescues coming in, we've even done some kind of minor, what you'd call outpatient surgery in, in people with animals because there is no options. Um, the one vet here that's supposed to be really good with reptiles is about two hours away from me, uh, each direction. Former vet for the Bronx Zoo, so you would think decent, absolutely terrible. Every time I went down there, they have not been able to solve any issue that I've had. They've charged me out the ass. One time I paid $700 to treat a snake myself because what they told me was so far wrong. Uh, they tried to tell me the issue with, was mites. And if you ever saw the picture of this snake with what happened, it was clearly either bacterial or fungal on the surface, nothing to do with mites whatsoever. The snake did, wasn't even anemic, um, which you often see anemia with mites because of all the blood, blood loss and all the things going on and passing around their system and the stress. Minor RI, secondary to whatever fungal issue was going on. Culture done, they couldn't find anything on the culture, although I don't even know if they did the culture properly because I was literally that unimpressed with this place. And that's the best place around. So, and they don't touch venomous at all. Um, and then the thing is too, I don't know New Hampshire's laws, but given that that snake is only allowed to be handled by people with the permit, does the permit give you permission to travel with that animal? Probably not. Uh, a lot of states restrict that. The animal's not allowed to leave your premises. And then can you get in trouble if you're allowing the vet to handle that animal, even though it's a medical person? Because like with the Lacey Act, for instance, even, you know, if you need to go to the next state to get to a decent vet, you can't, you can't cross state lines. Obviously that's been rectified now uh, with the US ARC lawsuit. But prior to that, if you had a African rock python in a legal state that didn't have a qualified vet and you needed to cross state lines to get to a qualified vet, you couldn't, that animal had to die. Um, so there's a lot involved with that issue that I think people that are just like, oh, you should take it to the vet, don't understand. Um, you know, there was one guy down in Massachusetts that used to be decent with snakes, but I don't even know if he touched venomous and I don't even know if he's still alive. Um, I haven't heard his name thrown around in years. My, my vet swears that I know more than her. Yeah, I mean, that's just how it goes. How far am I from nerd? About two to two and a half hours. As a vet, good luck finding a general practitioner that is equipped or comfortable dealing with a king cobra. Absolutely. Not, not only that, not only from the, the fact that you're equipped or, or prepared to deal with it, but if you can make a decent living dealing with, with dogs and cats or whatever, that yes, they can be dangerous in the right situation. And yeah, you might take a bite or get hurt or, you know, there are, are life-threatening situations. King cobra bites a totally different ball game. Um, even if you do survive it, the pain and everything that you're gonna go through for a while and the issues you can have pop up later on, why, why would you risk it? It's just, it's not even worth it to most vets. Um, you know, that the people that make good vets for stuff like that are because they have a passion pre-existing for those particular animals. Um, probably the best vet that I dealt with was not very knowledgeable on reptiles, but he loved them. And so he loved having us bring them because it would give him a reason to dive into the books and the research. And even the people that did the, ne the necropsy for Kevin, if you listen to them, they're, they're citing things that they were reading because they don't really know entirely everything that they're looking at and all of that. So they're going to the, you know, stuff to, to, to figure it out. And that's how a lot of vets are. Um, they'll get into forums within, you know, the vet circle. They'll go through books. They'll look at, you know, research and past things that have gone on with other vets. Uh, they have some great resources for that, but their hands-on experience with these animals is usually very, very limited. Um, and even more so when you talk about a truly, truly deadly, dangerous animal um, that, you know, you sneeze and, and you could be dead. So I, I think that was a very, very stupid thing for people to say. I understand the sentiment of where it's coming from, but I don't think they understand the situation uh, that he's in up there. You know, uh, some of these people that live in big, big cities or places that have a ton of venomous animals where there's a market for it. Because if there's one person with a venomous, venomous permit, how much money can you really make doing veterinary care for the once in a while that person needs it? It's just not practical. But if you live in an area like, say, Pennsylvania has, a, you know, some great laws, there's probably a couple of vets popping around that deal with that stuff because there's a market for it. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very few. Um, 
It's an exotic vet. If anyone's saying Kevin should take a cobra to a vet, that's great anymore. Imagine, imagine just walking into the lobby and being like, hi, I'm here with my King Cobra and seeing all the other people in there waiting out how, how quickly they're out the door and they don't want to come back to that vet. So that's another thing. The vet office doesn't want to lose their, their customers and business. And if they find out that animal's in there, some people with irrational fears will not come back. Um, so it, it's just not practical. We're way off topic and we're taking way too much time on this. That's the only thing I really wanted to dive into because that makes me absolutely just insanely angry with the stupidity of people that think that that is just, he's just going to go down the road 20 minutes, pop in to see, you know, Dr. Cheryl and she's going to be like, okay, yeah, bring in Lilith. Oh, let me, hi. You know, like, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Try to get a vet to see a short tail. I brought in incognito that time. I wanted to get a culture done when she had that swelling in her mouth, which ended up healing beautifully. And the vet was really cool about it and admitted that it was a little out of her depth. But incognito was 10 to 12 pounds. And they said she was too strong and that they were unable to get a culture from me. I could have stuck my finger in that snake's mouth. Now, mind you, she's with strangers, so she's going to behave a little bit differently. Also, I didn't know at that point that she was gravid. So that was part of the reason that she was probably a little bit more irritable than usual. But to get a swab in that snake's mouth, I could have done in my lap while I was talking to you right now. Um, and so it's just their inexperience and probably apprehension and nervousness with the animal. Um, but she was very cool. She's like, the only way I'd feel comfortable is anesthetizing her. And to be honest, she told me straight up, she's like, I don't want to anesthetize a snake because I don't know the proper amount and it's very dangerous and I could kill her. And so, you know, they basically told me she seems perfectly healthy other than that swelling, um, which, you know, I, I did a video and showed the swelling on here way back when that happened. Um, I don't know if it was just a minor infection where she pushed and broke a tooth or something, whatever it is, cleaned itself up beautifully. I think also with her body going through being gravid, which I didn't know, I think whatever it was had a little bit more opportunity Whereas maybe that infection, she would have staved off completely in a normal situation. But now that her body is not at 100% immune response because it's going through changes of, of reproduction, possibly that's why. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I couldn't even get a vet that was willing to see her to, to figure out one of the simplest procedures you could do on a snake and, and getting a, a culture done. Um, so I can't imagine trying to do exploratory surgery or something on a king cobra. Like that, that's... That's like a, a zoo specialist of a, of a place that has a good sized venomous collection, has somebody on staff or on call that really knows what they're doing. So let's pair some more snakes. That's, that's why you're here. Not to talk about how annoying it is to not be able to find a damn vet when we need one. So let's get somebody I know we could pair pretty quick here. She's nice and clean. So fresh and clean. This is my skunk line girl from Super Stripe Type Origins, which is going to Mr. Charlie Murphy. Hi, darling. What are you doing? It's just me. It's not food. It's not food. So you all know her. You've seen her. Lovely, lovely skunk line girl. Very, very wonderful animal. Um, I think I missed a sticker or super chat too. So let me check that real quick. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing so many things and jumping around. Justin, thank you. Dibs on those T-positive seven, T-positive. I got T-positive 007s right now, brother. Let's go. Love you too, Tim. I'm not getting into it, gets into it. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't want to get into all the hate and all the stupidity, but that's one of those things that's not an opinion. Like, if you say that that's what he should have done, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. Because it's just not possible. And that's just a lack of understanding, A, of what we're working with, B, the area that he's in. Um, you're, just, you're just basically showing that you have no idea what the fuck's going on. Charlie! Where are you, brother? Hi, brother. What's up? You in hiding over there? You in franking it? Mr. Charlie Murphy. Oops, cut it out of view. Another side swipe. If whoever here was at, asked about side swipe earlier, Charlie is another wonderful side swipe animal produced here. Um, 
So Atlas that I showed earlier, I produced. I produced Charlie here as well out of uh, Spot On and Ethel. So Charlie's going to pop in here with his lovely lady. Trying to make some darker stuff with them, hopefully. Uh, unfortunately, with the COVIDs, when I lost those animals, I lost the female that really was like kind of the linchpin in that project, the very dark side swipe female. Um, so that sucks. But for right now, we're going to work with him with that skunk line girl, hopefully get some dark stuff that way. If not, um, just in pairing side swipe stuff, I periodically get dark stuff. And so I'll just have to hold back another female at some point and go from there. Um, let's deal with, let me put them back and then I'm going to grab my Matrix Het T positive female. We're going to pair her up again. Uh, let me see what I missed here. 37 likes. Thank you guys. If you're here and you haven't hit that like button yet, don't forget. I'm going to keep reminding you. Dapper gentleman. He Decide which like more. So the skunks I can't take credit for. Uh, both my skunk females were produced by Jason Chapman. Uh, and Rob was involved in that as well because Rob was working with Jason up in Maine back then. Um, it's funny, I've mentioned it before on these live streams. Jason's the person in the reptile community I've known the longest. And we didn't meet for so long. So we talked on on forums like Fauna and King Snake and things like that and through email and whatever else over the years. Um, did some snake deals way back in like the mid 2000s, um, mid, mid to late, probably 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. Um, and we never met, never met, never met. And then I finally met Jason for the first time in I think like 2015, finally, after knowing him for like over a decade. And then we ran into each other like four or five times within like a year. So it was really funny. All that time went by, we never met, lived fairly close within like a four hour ride each way. Never met, never met at a show, nothing. And then all of a sudden we started seeing each other all the time. And uh, Jason is an absolutely great dude. Love Jason. Um, at some point, I want to get up to his place and do a video, but without a car right now, I I'm, I'm, can't really travel much. So, I was supposed to go up there last summer, and then we just, I was busy, he was busy, life, life happens, as we all know. Wasn't able to get up there, but I would like to at some point. And he's not really a guy that wants to sit there and be talking on a video, but we're going to twist his arm at some point. Audio keeps going out. I don't know if it's my side or yours. Anybody else having a problem? Also, when I'm walking away and talking, you're not going to be able to hear me as well because I'm not as close. So I don't know if it's that that you're talking about. Um, hopefully it's not on my end. My internet does suck here. Shout out to hashtag Comcast sucks. I need more local reptile friends that don't just have a normal ball python. What is your favorite boa? Well... Since that's a broad question, I'm going to give you a broad answer and say absolutely green anacondas, hands down. They're messy, dirty, filthy snakes that get quite large, but I love their personalities. Um, I love everything about them. I think they're beautiful animals. Um, I think they're incredible. Uh, I'm not really into like your BCC, BCI, BI, BC, whatever the fuck they're calling them now because I know the taxonomy has changed a little bit there and I'm not into boas enough to know the current taxonomy, but, um, but definitely uh, green anacondas. And those are a species that I would love to keep if I could keep them legally here. Um, obviously right now I don't have room anyway, so I wouldn't have one. Um, but if I can move and I get more space and uh, if I'm in a legal state, that's definitely an animal that's on my list. And if I move, I'm gonna try to go to a state where things like that are legal. Uh, also crocodilians, because I do want to work with crocodilians again someday not on any crazy scale like i don't want niles or salt waters or anything like that but I'd like to be able to to be somewhere where i can have an indoor outdoor setup of some type um depending on the climate and where i am so that i might be able to have a, a couple of gators or something 
Um, you know, maybe one day I would get like a more lets or something if I got into crocodiles, but that wouldn't be for a long time. Yeah, oh yeah, Jason, uh, Jason actually produced my olive python female in 2011. Uh, I didn't get her through him. Uh, he sold her to Chris. Chris sold her to this kid, Brandon, and I got her off of Brandon. Um, but he's the one that produced her, and then Jeff Hartwig produced my male. Um, but yeah, no, Jason, uh, Jason's got some cool stuff. Um, he's had some ups and downs, man, mostly outside of his control. But uh, I'm glad that he's always been able to kind of stick it out and keep working with these animals because he's passionate about it, and he's a super nice guy if you ever run into him at a show. Um, he's super nice. And I know, um, you know, it's tough sometimes with like social media because, uh, certain people have like, I don't want to say strong personalities, but like Jason's into certain things like politically that I know a lot of people are not, um, you know, and I, I tend to be more on the side of things that he's on anyway. So I don't notice it as much, but stepping outside objectively, I can see where people be like, eh, I don't know. Um, and a, a lot of us are, are like that. So I could see that with a lot of people. I'm not just pointing out him. But if you get a chance to talk to Jason and get to know him, he is just a wonderful human being, uh, especially if you see him at a show, say hello, you know, um, just a great guy. I would buy a million snakes from him if he had stuff that I wanted and I could afford it. Right now, I can't afford to buy anything. So we are not going to be buying anything. Okay, I just came up with another video idea. Good, shoot me a message, whatever. Let's see what we can do. I'm not having any audio issues. It's when you were close to the camera. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm putting my finger in front of you again. It's just easier with this hand. Dun, dun, dun. I'm sure I missed some comments. I'm sorry for that. I don't know why short tails and bloods look almost identical. I don't get why blood, short tails and bloods look almost identical. I'm sure at some point in time, uh, they share some form of common ancestry. Um, you know, I would imagine maybe way, way back they were the same thing, um, split off into these separate regions and islands and then became acclimated to their region. Um, you know, with the Sumatrans being darker, maybe it's a little bit of a cooler climate where they are as compared to where the Bloods are staying. So maybe they evolved in a way to take advantage of grabbing whatever they can to stay warmer. You know, Borneos obviously are isolated on islands over there, so they developed a little bit differently probably to maximize their habitat. Um, and then over the course of generations have become new species. Um, and that's the thing that, that a lot of people don't realize. Um, there's some great documentaries out there. There's some island chains where the same, there's, there's the same species of bird but they've evolved completely different. Um, and so even though they are the same species, they, they were talking about like hybridization and they, they were even putting them together, like trying to see if they would breed and they wouldn't. They only wanted to breed with their, um, their species ideally, or at least in an environment where they had the choice. They would always pair up with their, and they knew the difference even though they're the same species. Um, and so they were talking about like, at what point are they considered a separate species and giving the criteria for that, be it, you know, physical differences, attributes, behavior, um, part of it was that kind of breeding stuff where if they're no longer looking to breed with these animals that are the same species, well, obviously something is different. And so they're researching now trying to figure out all the DNA level stuff and going through all that. But there's some interesting stuff out there. I love documentaries. I'll watch documentaries on just about any, anything from fucking aliens to animals to, you know, um, crime stuff, anything. I, I just love documentaries. I love seeing how stuff is made, how things work and diving in. Um, and, you know, you're always getting whoever put it together's perspective. I mean, shit, I watched that Britney Spears documentary. I don't care. If you get a documentary on something, I'll check it out. And, uh, but and that Britney Spears shit was pretty fucking wild. Gotta tell you, man, I didn't realize all the crazy shit she had going on in her life. But God bless her. She's free now of that shit. Because I, I would have been in jail if I was her, without a doubt. 
Yeah, the colors are different and even their bodies are different. Their, their overall size can be different. Their personalities can be different. Um, you know, very, very rarely do I see Curtis um, flop and swim like Bloods and Borneos do. Borneos do it the most. Um, Curtis, it's like very rare. Um, and part of that, I think, is their laid back personality. They take stress a little bit better. Um, but yeah, just Borneos, you know, the moment they get triggered, it's like, oh, we flop around, especially when they're younger. You're going to head out. See you, Tim. These Canadians, man, I'll tell you. Got some nice. Who has some nice marble stuff right now? Is that Matt you're talking about? Uh, let me grab another snake here. Let's do some more pairings. That's what you guys are here for. See the snakes, not listen to me drone on. Uh, why did you destroy your cage? Your cage was clean. What happened? What happened? I don't think it's dirty. I think she just tossed it. Uh. Hi, Grouch. Yeah, you're not dirty. You just rearranged your papers, which is allowed. I just got to be a little careful with this girl because she's a little crabby sometimes. So we're going to pick her up quick, let you see her. She's already trying to shrug me off. This is my Matrix Het T positive female. I'm gonna get her in here quick because she will uh, she will take a swing if she gets a little annoyed. Uh, the marble male. Gonna go up one. Hi, bud. What's up? Hi. Yeah. No, not food. Just me. And of course, you all know this fellow right here, Mr. T positive Batik, produced here as well in the joint project with Mr. Dylan Hain. Also huge congrats to Mr. Dylan Hain and Mrs. Cheyenne Hain on their beautiful new baby, who I cannot wait to go and meet. Oh, bud, you're falling. You're falling, man. But he's, he's awesome. He's always been a little bit of a weird animal uh, in like his personality, but I love him. So we're gonna put him in with that lovely lady there. They've been breeding really well. She's got a nice thick center, so I'm hoping uh, they'll keep going. We'll get a couple more meals in her and see an ovulation, hopefully. Um, no ovulations yet, but honestly, we're getting into that time where I would first start seeing them uh, soon, given when I pair and, and when I usually see eggs and babies and all that. So... No, uh, no concern that there's no ovulations yet at this time of year. Uh, my, oops, hold on. my baby season, typically the earliest I, I have babies hatching is May, uh, which means those babies are getting laid in March, which means those are the females that ovulate around now. Um, because typically about 50 days after ovulation, is when you're gonna see eggs. And that's a rough estimate. It can be much different. Um, but you know, if they were to ovulate now, typically they'll shed out in about two weeks after ovulation. And then you've got about 30 days, um, give or take, till eggs. I've had as early as day 26 and as late as day 52 uh, after they're shed. So, um, you know, if you got if you got ovulation now, shed out in a couple of weeks, laid in about a month, you know, now you're looking laying eggs sometime maybe between like March 6th and March 15th, somewhere in that window. And then those babies are going to hatch around the middle of May, um, depending on your incubation temperatures and all that stuff. So that's the earliest that I normally get an ovulation would be about now. Um, but the latest babies I can remember hatching was, I believe, Electra's second clutch hatched while I was at Tinley in October. And I think they hatched around October 15th of that year. Um, so that means that she would have laid those eggs in about mid-August um, and would have ovulated around... Um, 
the beginning of July. So, you know, uh, there's a, there's a pretty big window there. And, uh, so we're just starting the time where you might see ovulations. And right now, all my girls are still on food. All the males have still been interested. Uh, so typically, once the males stop showing interest, that means her body, something has changed and he's no longer interested. Um, you know, I can't think of any males that have locked post ovulation that I'm aware of. It may have happened with a female I missed an ovulation on, but I, I, I can't remember. Typically, I stop pairing and then I'll get an ovulation a bit after that. They can retain sperm for a certain amount of time. Um, I don't know how long they can, but I do know that people have had clutches the following season from a pairing the previous. So I've got to think at least probably seven to eight months, if not a little bit longer. Um, and that's just based on what I understand. That's not based on personal experience. I've never had ret a retained sperm clutch, at least that I'm aware of. Um, especially because fertility is typically reduced in that case because it's been stored so long and all of that. Um, so you usually see a lot more slugs or a lot more duds. Um, and even Raiden, her last clutch where I had bred her the previous season, nothing happened. And then I only saw that one lock. Well, obviously one, it was from him because I wouldn't have gotten, uh, stuff with golden eye in there if it was from the previous season because the previous season she was with a T positive matrix. Um, but anyhow, all 10 of those eggs were good. So that wasn't anything where I would have felt like it was from the previous season. It's been open. Uh, oh, Electra. Electra might need to be cleaned. So, put that over there just in case. And now Electra can be a little dicey because she is very food motivated. And she's already watching me at the front of the, front of the bin, which tells me she is definitely looking for food right now. Um, because she doesn't give two shits that I'm in the room, except for the fact that I might have food. So let's see, we'll turn, you, we'll turn you down so you can take a look at her and see, see if she's going to be real food motivated today or what. Bear with me a second, I got some cords back here. Uh, I think you should. Move you so you're not in my not in my way as I try to do this. Yeah, she's definitely looking for food. She's not being super crazy because she would have been up about two feet higher right now. But I am still going to have to be careful. Because like I said, she's a very food motivated snake. And she's not mean, so once, once she knows what's going on, we're good. But it's just a matter of getting her to that point. And she's very good at coming back over her own body. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi. Are we good now? Are you aware of what's going on? Yeah. You can talk. That's fine. So now she's good. Ooh, she's getting very, very solid. She might be heading towards an ovulation now. We'll see. We'll throw Orion in there anyways, because if she is, it's a good time to capitalize on it. We're just going to give this a quick half-ass cleaning here. Not going to go crazy, crazy, but obviously she let out a ton of liquid, which they do. Um, and people, you know, the real, like, science nerds with snakes get mad if you call it pee, because technically it's not, but... You know, it smells like pee, it's liquid like pee. Um, these snakes are one of the, the few that really do it in a volume like this. Um, and under normal circumstances, I'd have a lot like thicker paper base. But because right now I'm still treating with Prevenamite, um, just to make sure these mites are all gone for good, um, I... Uh, you know, have to spray all the paper and everything like that, and it gets very, very expensive. I've probably spent close to a grand now on Um 
uh, maybe not that much, but certainly north of six or seven hundred dollars. Um, just kind of going ham and making sure I don't have a problem. So I try to use a limited amount of paper unless it's a snake that I know gets really nervous and needs to hide. Um, and she's honestly one of my more nervous animals as far as like strangers go. But she's perfectly comfortable with me. So me being in and out of here doesn't bother her. She doesn't hide if I'm around. So we're gonna let that sit for a, a minute. Get a little contact time there, clean up. Oh, enjoy my crotch, sorry. All right, let me see if we missed any comments here. Sure tastes like pee, that it does. Shit, she's talking, somebody get Alexis. Oh my God, old man Kyle. You got a hairline like mine, buddy. I want to see so bad, but reputable sources in my state are not existing. Uh, you don't need to have one in your state. You know, people ship. Shipping is, is pretty safe as long as it's done by reputable people. Um, I've shipped a lot of snakes over the years, knock on wood. I've had some issues with delays and things, but never had an animal get sick or get lost or, or die or anything like that. Have I ever had a wild caught specimen? Um... I had one short tail that was likely wild caught, but unknown. Um, she was a, a very old, normal Borneo. Um, you know, she was she was she would have been in her early twenties right now. Uh, she passed, but um, there's a pretty good chance she was an import animal. Um, the main species that I've worked with that have been wild caught has been rock pythons, and I actually prefer wild caught over captive bred, and that's the one species I feel that way with. Um, typically, I like what captive breeding does for them, uh, but I, the only rock pythons that have ever bitten me have been captive bred. Um, wild caughts, yes, they are unruly in the beginning, and you really have to develop a relationship and earn their respect. Um, and actually, I had a long conversation with Ryan Young on the phone about this with the white lips, um, where every single captive bred white lip he's ever made is just a, a, a bag of dicks. And a lot of the wild caught animals are, are his calmer animals. And, you know, I hate to anthropomorphize, but you still try to look at what's going on and, and kind of gather some perspective. I think some of these wild caught animals, once they get settled into captivity and once they learn the routine, kind of realize like, hey, this isn't so bad. I'm not getting fucked with by predators. I've got steady food. I've got clean water. I've got my own spaces to hide and sit. And now not all wild caught animals calm down to that level or do that well. But I think the ones that do start to realize that seem to do really, really well um, and kind of figure it out. And with rock pythons, I've, I've probably had about 15 wild caught ones over the years, never been bitten once. Um, all of them have settled down. Um, now I technically own one now, but she's not here. I have her out of state. Um, but she, uh, she was a, an import before that stopped. They're not allowed to be imported anymore. Uh, but she's an import. She came straight out of Africa, made a quick stop in Florida and up to here. Um, and I, I love her to death. Her and I have a great relationship. Uh, but the first six months, she wanted nothing to do with me. If you brought her outside, she would chase you. Um, I mean, she, she would stand her ground and then some, once, once you pissed her off, she would definitely keep coming at you until she knew you were leaving and, and she won. Um, and I mean, it was funny cause she was like this big and she's trying to like, you know, literally he thinks she's going to kill me. I'm like, it's not going to work out for you, sweetheart. Um, and then I actually kept her in my kitchen when I first got her. She was just, she was so small. She was in a 15 quart tub in my kitchen. I had a little heat thing set up on one of my counters that that's like, it's not a counter for like food preparation. It's um, built into the, there's a wall there where it's built into and uh, you guys have probably seen it in a lot of my videos where those glass cabinets are and there's all those drawers uh, in the background of some of the videos I've done in the kitchen in the past. 
So I had her set up on there and I wanted to do the kitchen because it's a room that I'm in and out of enough during the day, but also like not in there an overwhelming amount of time where she had time to decompress and do whatever. And so it gave her a chance to observe me. I, I found rock pythons to be very visual animals and very observant of everything you do. And so if you give them the opportunity to watch you, they will. They learn your movements. Uh, I also scent train them once they're settled in. So I think people make a mistake sometimes trying to scent train from the beginning. And if an animal's unsettled and you're trying to scent train them, then you're not getting the association that you're going for. The whole point of scent training is one, to get them used to your scent, but two, to get your scent to be associated with an area they feel comfortable. Um, and so once they're settled into their enclosure, that's when I begin scent training. And so I did that with her as well. Um, and what that is, is just like, imagine I'm wearing this t-shirt, but pretend it's a, a junk t-shirt I don't care about. I'll wear it around the house uh, for a couple evenings after work, three or four nights, do some work, sweating it a little bit, make sure like my scent's really in there, cut it up and use that for substrate in her cage. Uh, and do that for a period of time, like I said, once she's settled in, and then that scent is a constant for her. So when you're, so now she's learned your movements through the visual time that she's had to observe you at her leisure, where she feels comfortable to watch you. Now your scent's a part of the environment. So the only thing coming in that's changing and that she's not used to is, is her being touched. And that's not as big of a hump to get over as scent and movement threats are. Uh, that's a pretty easy one, that sensory thing. Uh, depending on the individual snake and depending on the species, some are more or less prone. Certain senses are really where they're, they're geared. Um, but that's why like king cobras are very visual. So that's why somebody can be holding a king cobra, but it's always facing away from them and going after what's moving in front of them. Um, because they're, that, that is their dominant sense. They're, they're following what they're seeing as opposed to what they're feeling. Um, and so once you get past that with these certain species with their more dominant senses where you're not triggering a fear response, then it's a lot easier to go in and work with them and manipulate. And she was pretty good after that. Uh, as she got bigger and, and a little bit more of a commanding presence, she um, is aware of it. And so the terms of our relationship change a little bit where there are some rules that she has that I have to follow for our relationship to stay where it's at. So each of us has expectations. I know what mine are. She knows what hers are. We don't know what the other person is, and we're trying to figure that out. And so it's some trial and error, and you have to learn the behavior, and she's got to learn my behavior and whatever. And so she doesn't like to be pulled out of her cage. She likes to come out on her own. So if you allow her to do that, everything's hunky-dory and wonderful. If you break from that routine that we've established and I go in and try to remove her, she will let me know that she's displeased. Now, she won't bite me, she won't strike at me, but what she'll do is she will wrap coils around my arm and she will go as tight as she can until my arm is purple and she will sit there and just grind. And that's what she does if I go outside of that routine and do something she doesn't like. That's her message to me. And then I know next time, don't do that. And uh, as long as I follow the routine, she's never done that to me outside of that. She's never tried to bite me, you know, since she's been a baby. So the past, oh, Jesus, I don't know how old she is now. She's going to be 11 this year, I believe. I would say the past decade, I haven't had any issues. Um, she can be a little talkative at times. Just cleaning out this tub. Now that it sat for a little bit, uh, she'd be a little talkative, you know, I wouldn't just like let her crawl into my face. Uh, that's another thing with rock pythons. Um, they know what's a threat and they know your face is a threat. And uh, so if you're going to get bit by them, that's typically what they're going to go for. So I just don't take those chances with her um, unless we're in a situation where I feel like she's really in a receptive mood. She's initiating the interaction um, with all positive body language and everything else. And it's really cool because I know her so well, I can see her body language um, flip immediately and know that she's gone from everything's okay to this is a problem uh, within two seconds of it happening. So it really helps our relationship for us to work together because 
I know exactly what she's thinking. Uh, give me one second, I just gotta grab some paper to throw down in here. So that, that's my favorite thing, is being able to, to build relationships with these animals where you understand them, they understand you, and you're able to do things that you normally shouldn't be able to do with those animals because of that. Um, and part of the reason you're able to is because you don't push them past their limits. And that's a big thing. People try to take liberties, and that's where you ruin those relationships. Hi, bud. What's up? So here's Mr. Orion. Uh, he's who we're going to be pairing to the lovely Electra. This is another mother-son pairing. Uh, he is her her son. Yeah, well, you got one little piece of shed. <laughs> that was like two scales worth. Uh, so I'm going to put him in here first, just because once she gets in here, um, she gets sometimes she'll start coming out looking for food again. Hi. How we doing? You are in a position that I don't like very much. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yes, trust me. Yeah, she's getting very firm down in her tail end. Um, so it might be soon for her. We'll see if they pair up. He's very, very, um, he is his father's son. So he will... Just, for a quick second, she's so pretty. Ooh, what happened? Just such a pretty animal. They both are, but I absolutely love her color. And her color has added so much to that project. Uh, and that's why I want to put him back to her. I had always hoped to get a male that looks kind of like Astra does uh, with the side swipe gene to put that back to her. Uh, but Orion so far is the, uh, the most colorful that I have. Um, so that's what we're rolling with for right now. Because Electra, Electra's not, not that old. I forget how old she is now. Um, I think she's, uh, I want to say she's a 2012. I'd have to ask Kara. I don't remember. I got her in 2014, so maybe not. Maybe she's older. Maybe she's a 2010. Man, I don't know. My memory's bad. I used to know everybody's birth dates and all that. Now I'm all over the place. Um, oh, one more pairing I totally forgot about. I forgot about the lovely Morticia with Midnight Rider, who's another one that's got stuck shed. I swear to God, all my males this time of year. See you, Kyle. Where did you get those large red bins? Uh, those are from Walmart. They only sell them seasonally. They're Christmas tree tubs, so there might still be some now. Otherwise, you gotta wait till next year, or you can try to go through the container store if you have one of those near you. And a hop for now, good stream. Start watching more if you have Rock Python content. Yeah, I won't for a while right now because I can't have her here. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't get to see her right now. But she's been on the channel in the past. I'm going to move this for a minute. I can get Morticia down here. Hopefully she's clean. I don't want to have to clean that tub. But they do what the F they want. Let's have a look. Here. Oh, you're clean enough. Looks like you spilled some water at one point, but we can live with that. So let me get you guys back over here. We'll grab Morticia for a second. She's definitely in food mode too. Hi, gorgeous. Hey, come here, you. Oh, yeah. I'm crawling through your water at some point. Here's the lovely Morticia. You can see a little bit of her pattern with all the bright light in here. But normally, you know, if you didn't see her in the bright light, she's very dark. Ha, huh, you took a girl. She went through an adolescent phase where she was kind of a, a crab and real dramatic about stupid things. 
But fortunately, she grew out of it, and she's fantastic again like she used to be. Hi, bud. Hi. It's me. Oh, not food. Not food. Not food. And then, of course, this is Mr. Midnight Rider right here. So he's got some stuff shed in his neck. I'm going to have to soak him again. Uh, he doesn't really like me messing with his head and neck like that. It's off of his eyes, so, you know, he can work the rest out at some point, but I'll, I'll throw him through another soak and go from there. So we're going to pair them up, too. I was worried for a while because the Morticia was acting very male-like uh, when I had paired them up initially. And then he went into shed, and I hadn't seen a, a successful lock or anything, uh, so I got real worried. Uh, they were constantly on opposite sides and just not looking like they were into it. And like I said, the behavior I saw from Morticia had me worried that maybe she was missexed. But the last time I paired them up, they locked beautifully, um, seemed to get along much better. And right now, putting them together, no negative reaction at all. So I think it was just a, a spoiled snake getting used to sharing her space. Um, and now she's gotten over that. You know, because you got to keep in mind, some of these snakes have not seen another snake for four, five, six years, and then all of a sudden, there's one in their space, and, you know, if she's not at a certain point in her cycle, she might not be overly receptive, um, but we seem to have gotten her there, and they're doing well now. Hi, darling. So we paired up, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six pairs, um, rolling with... Six males, seven females this season. Um, we'll see what we get. You know, if I get seven clutches, that's fine. It's a lot of work, but so be it. But I typically plan on, on getting less clutches than I pair. Usually, for whatever reason, you'll miss one or two. Um, whether, you know, you just missed the window where she was most fertile, or maybe you thought she was ready and she wasn't. Um, you know, whatever it is. But, but ho hopefully you know, get at least three or four clutches out of it and, and have a nice season and produce some cool babies and move some projects forward. And as I mentioned last time, Astra Voodoo Queen and this skunk female are on the docket for next year. Um, Sambuca, if I feel like she's good and knock on wood, um, she's been doing really fantastic. She's not been doing her dicey eating stuff. She's been eating great. Um, and she's starting to kind of act like herself again. So I'm, I'm hoping she was just kind of going through a phase of something, and now, now she's back to, to being Sambuca. Um, if I do breed her next year, it will be the last time. Um, if I don't, it's probably just I'm not going to breed her again. Um, so cross your fingers. I'd love to do one more clutch from her, get a couple more cool chromes, um, and then she'll just be retired to being a pet, um, which when she was going through the, kind of that funky phase, she was not as apt to be handled as she normally is because normally she's a big sweetheart um, but she was definitely a little bit more irritable uh, thank you guys that made it all the way through this video we're at about close to the two hour mark um, so I said we would give some stuff away and we will so I had I think five people that entered One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we had five people that entered. Um, and you know what? I am going to give something to all of them if they so desire. But I am going to do um, a t-shirt for somebody for sure. And so what I'm going to do is decide. Um, I'll talk to these guys because they're all people that I talk to. And we'll, we'll pick something out and do something Um to, to decide who, which, which person I'll do. Um, obviously I'm not going to make them choose, but we'll do some kind of drawing or something. I'll see what they're into, uh, and do that. And then I'll, I'll send the rest of them some stickers if they want them or, uh, you know, something along those lines. So I appreciate all you guys that hit that like button. I appreciate all you guys that hung in here and watched pair some snakes, talk some snakes, talk some shit. Um, thank you guys that super chatted and stickered everybody. I don't want to start listing off people because I will forget. I know Mike, though, I'll definitely say thank you because he threw a huge one down there. Uh, much appreciated for that. 
Uh, so thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. And we will see you soon. Hopefully I can start getting some regular episodes up and up and running again. Um, now that I'm, I'm feeling better and I'm starting to get my house in order and everything else, uh, get some time to actually put together some, some good content again. Although I think we went over some stuff in this video that was, uh, was good stuff and informative and you got to see some cool snakes. Thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you guys that are US ARC members. Much appreciated. If you're not, please look into it. Um, we talked about all that. Uh, so Kyle made a good point just really quickly. Absolutely, when you talk about import animals, uh, a lot of times the people collecting them don't give two shits about them other than the dollar signs that they are, and they're in some rough treatment and rough stuff when they come over. So that's why you really have to give those animals a lot of time. Uh, they need it. Next video, hold on, let me see what you said. It goes away so fast. Yeah, I want to do the poop one. I just, the snake I want to use in the video um, because he's he's the one that's going to let me really manipulate him probably the most. Um, when I went to shoot the video last time, he was in shed and then he was, um, you know, he ate and whatever else. So hopefully he'll be available. If I have to use another snake, I will, but I just think he's going to tolerate the most where I can kind of flip him around and talk about some things and show some things and, and go from there. So I'll try to get that one out next. I'll do my best. Thank you guys. Good night. We're going to get out of here. Um, you know, if you're watching this video later on, don't forget to leave a comment. Don't forget to hit the like button. It all helps no matter how long. I'm going to keep pushing it out there. Just stop by to say, hey, poop, it went by so fast. Thank you, Garrett. I appreciate that, man. I still need to get out there and see you and play with some Super Dwarf stuff. I don't know if I'm up for the task, you know, those, those big mean retics. Um, but when I get a car, I'll definitely be hitting you up. Uh, I got to swing through a bunch of people in Pennsylvania anyways. I got to go visit Mr. Minnetola. I got to get out to Dylan's again. Go see my, my rock python for one and go meet the new baby. So I appreciate you stopping through, Garrett. Appreciate everything that you guys do over there. Um, not wearing your shirt tonight, wearing my own. But, you know, once in a while, I got to do something. We'll do it, man. We'll do it. Uh, I definitely want to come over there and see that shit because I love, I love what you've been doing with lineage and everything else like that. Rhapsody is not the one year like without pooping. That's with the soap, removing urates. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I figured once those urates freed up, she would. Um, but obviously it's it's a little bit difficult with you having them at your mom's right now with all that bullshit with your, your place um, to be handling a little more often because handling really, really helps too. Because they're so sedentary and because they're so lazy, sometimes that encouragement will uh, get them to go to the bathroom. Like even, even now with like hatchlings where they're pooping a lot, you'll clean them because they pooped and then picking them up and moving them around, they poop again. Everybody's like, oh, they just love to poop in clean enclosures. It's not so much that, it's you've done something outside the routine, moved their body around, shifted some stuff through, and so now it comes back out. Um, but we'll see you guys soon. Thank you everybody again. You guys have a good night and I'm gonna put my thumb in your face one more time. We'll see you, thank you.